All right, so let's get started, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Uh, this is the IRTF open meeting at uh, IRTF 118 in Prague. Uh, my name is Colin Perkins uh, from the University of Glasgow. Uh, I'm the IRTF chair. Uh, we've got a, a reasonably full agenda, so we'll, we'll get started uh, uh, quickly today. So to begin with, uh, a reminder that uh, this is an IRTF meeting, uh, and by participating, you agree to follow the IETF uh, intellectual property rights disclosure rules, uh, which also apply to the IRTF. In particular, uh, if you're aware of that uh, the contributions you're making are covered by patents or patents applications that are owned by you or your sponsors, you need to disclose that. Uh, and the IRTF uh, prefers uh, liberal licensing terms and timely disclosures. Uh, and the RFCs cited on the slide uh, give the details of, of, of these policies. In addition, uh, we make audio video recordings of these sessions available. Uh, the session is being streamed live on YouTube and on the IETF website, uh, and the recording will also go onto YouTube after the meeting. If you participate uh, and you're, you're not wearing uh, one of the red uh, do not photograph lanyards, then you consent to appear in the recordings. Uh, and if you speak at the microphone, uh, or if you are myself or one of the, the three speakers, then you are going to be recorded and you're going to be online. If you're participating online, uh, please turn off your camera and microphone unless you're actively trying to speak. Uh, and uh, a reminder that if you do turn on your camera or you speak into the online session, you will be recorded and your recording will, will go up on YouTube. In addition, uh, as a participant, you, uh, um, you acknowledge that any personal information you have provided will be handled in accordance with the uh, ITFs and IRTFs privacy policy. Uh, and you agree to follow the code of conduct and the anti-harassment procedures uh, and to work respectfully with the other participants there. If you have any concerns about conduct, uh, please contact uh, either myself uh, or the Ombuds team uh, and we'll do what we can to, to help uh, address those concerns uh, for you. In-person participants, uh, please do uh, sign into the on-site tool in Metaco uh, by scanning the QR code, uh, which is on the screen. Um, this is how we figure out how big a room is to have. Uh, by signing into Metaco on-site, uh, your, your presence is noted, and we use that to make sure we have enough seats uh, for the next meeting. So please do sign in. Uh, remote participants, uh, again, uh, turn off your audio and video unless you're actively intending to speak. And a reminder that this is an IRTF session, an Internet Research Task Force session, and the IRTF is uh, a, a parallel organization to the IETF, um, which focuses on longer term research issues related to the Internet, rather than standards development. In the IRTF, we're here to do research, we're not here to develop standards. Um, and so the, the focus of the, the discussions tends to be um, perhaps a little uh, longer, longer term focused, a little more open ended. While we can publish informational and experimental documents in the RFC series, uh, and we, we do publish informational and experimental documents in the RFC series, the primary output of the research groups is typically um, understanding and research papers. A large number of our, of our research groups um, do not um, do, do not publish RFCs at all. They just uh, they have talks. They publish research papers. Um, so again, the, the focus is on research rather than on RFCs. The IRTF is organized as a number of research groups. Uh, there's uh, 15 current research groups, of which 13 are meeting this week. Uh, the two highlighted in dark blue on the slide, uh, the, the Gaia group, which looks at global access to the internet, uh, and the network management research group uh, will be meeting tomorrow. Uh, the others, uh, the, those, um, those highlighted in light blue, uh, have met earlier this week. So um, unfortunately, you've missed them if you did not go. Uh, but please do look out. The recordings uh, are all available. 
Uh, one piece of research group news. Uh, I'm very pleased to, to announce that we've uh, recently rechatted the Internet Congestion Control Research Group. Um, and I'm pleased that uh, Reese Enkart and Vidi Gull uh, will be joining Simone Thelen as chairs of that group. Uh, Reese is here this week. Uh, Vidi and Simone are, are remote. Uh, but uh, if you see Reese, I don't know if they're in the room today. But if you see them, please do say hello. We have published uh, a few RFCs, uh, mostly from the Cryptographic Forum Research Group, uh, which met in, in the previous session. Uh, we've had RFC, uh, RFCs from that group on RSA blind signatures, uh, the SPAKE2 uh, password authenticated key exchange algorithm, uh, verifiable random functions, and hashing through elliptic curves. And from the uh, PathAware Networking Group, there was a, a document uh, discussing a vocabulary of path, path properties. Uh, and, and all of these have been published uh, since the last uh, ITF meeting uh, earlier this summer. One of the um, one of the things we have been doing in, in the the IRSG, the the steering group for the IRTF, is discussing uh, a draft which provides an IRTF specific code of conduct. The IETF has had a code of conduct for many years, RFC 7154, um, but it's very much focused on the effective conduct of the standards process. Uh, and if you read it, most of the discussion uh, is about how to effectively develop standards in a uh, consensus-based organization and how to work respectfully together to develop standards. There's not been an IRTF-specific code of conduct uh, until now. The draft uh, listed on the slide, Draft Perkins IRTF Code of Conduct, is an attempt at providing that. Um, it's focused on a research organization, uh, and so the emphasis is somewhat different to the, the IETF Code of Conduct, which focuses on standards. Um, and it's something that, it's, it's an early draft, it's a dash zero zero draft, but it's something we've been discussing in the IRSG for a couple of months now. I would encourage you to please read this draft. Please read it. Um, if you have opinions on the draft, if you have feedback on the draft, please uh, send it to the IRSG uh, using the IRSG at irtf.org list. Uh, we're very much seeking your input to make sure that this says the right things, to make sure it's, it's an appropriate code of conduct for the organization. Uh, the goal is to try and get this published by the next meeting, or at least ready to publish by the next meeting. So please do read it, please do send feedback, uh, and we will be we will be updating it quite aggressively over the coming months. In addition to the research groups, uh, the IRTF also runs the Applied Networking Research Group. This is something we run in cooperation with the Internet Society, with support from uh, Comcast and NBC University. The Applied Networking Research Prize is here to recognize the best uh, recent results in applied networking. It's here to recognize interesting new ideas from the research community that might be of relevance to the Internet Standards community. And it's here to recognize upcoming people that are likely to have an impact on Internet Standards and Internet technology. I'm very pleased to announce that we'll be making three uh, ANRP awards today. First, we'll go to Shiva Karkala for his work on uh, verifying the correctness of name server implementations. The second, we'll go to Dennis uh, Troutwein um, for his work on content addressable peer-to-peer -peer storage in the IPFS protocol. And the third goes to uh, Ramakrishnan Sundara Raman uh, for his work on identifying and locating in-network censorship devices. Uh, those of you who uh, were in the summer meeting in San Francisco uh, will note uh, uh, Shiva's talk was originally scheduled for then. Uh, unfortunately, due to illness, we had to reschedule it, but, uh, uh, and we'll have a, a remote talk today. But I think all, all three of these are going to be fantastic talks. I'm very much looking forward to them. Uh, if you want to read the papers, there are links to them on the website listed, uh, and uh, the slides are also on the website there and in the data tracker. So we'll be getting onto those in a minute. In addition, uh, the ANRP relies on your nominations. We've had 
a number of absolutely fantastic talks over the, the, the number of years this, uh, this award has been running. Um, I think it's been a great success. But in order to make it a success, we need your nominations. So please do, um, you know, please do nominate if you go to the, the website listed on the slide. Uh, the nomination deadline is the end of next week. Uh, uh, both both um, self-nominations, third-party nominations with uh, permission are accepted. If you know any good work, please do contact the authors, uh, or if they're grad students, please do contact their advisor and encourage them to nominate. Uh, we, we do appreciate your nominations. In addition to the, uh, the prizes, we also run the Applied Networking Research Workshop. Uh, the NRW uh, for 2024 will co-locate with uh, the IETF 120 meeting in Vancouver next uh, next July. Uh, the office for the, the organizers for that will be Simone Ferlin uh, from Red Hat, uh, Ignacio Castro from Queen Mary University of London. Uh, I can't see him right now. I suspect he's in the room. Ignacio, right at the back there, uh, is the is uh, here. So if you have any questions about the NRW, please do grab him in the hallway. Uh, and expect the call for papers in early 2024. I'll also note that uh, we're very pleased to offer a number of travel grants uh, due to very generous support from Akamai, Comcast, and Netflix. Uh, we've got, uh, um, I forget exactly how many, four or five people here uh, at this meeting uh, uh, through, through these travel grants. Um, we will be opening the call for travel grants for the, 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 the Brisbane meeting shortly. Um, so if, if you are, are interested in receiving one of these travel grants, uh, please do look out for the announcement uh, uh, at the URL given uh, shortly after this meeting. And again, thank you to the, the sponsors uh, for providing the travel grants. And if you are interested in uh, expanding the travel grant from provision, please do contact me or, or contact uh, Stephanie McKinnon uh, from the Secretariat and we will work to take your money and put it to good use. And that is all I have to say. The remainder of the agenda, uh, we will start with a, a remote talk from uh, Shiva Kakala, who will be talking about uh, automatically finding RFC compliance bugs in name servers. Following that, uh, we'll move on to uh, Dennis's talk on IPFS and then uh, uh, Ram's talk on um, locating and identifying censorship devices. Okay, so let me share the slides. Okay. All right, Shiva, I'll just pass you control and then do the quick introduction. I can find you in the list. Okay, so the, the first of the Applied Networking Research Prize talks today, I'm very pleased, is from Shiva Kakala. Uh, Shiva's a senior researcher at Microsoft Research. Uh, he's in interested in uh, researching all aspects of the design and implementation of high-performance network automation tools with insights from verification, testing, anomaly detection, algorithms, and autonomous theory. He's got a PhD from UCLA, uh, I think from 2022 was that, uh, if I remember yeah. correctly. Uh, and his research there was focused on using formal methods to improve the robustness of the DNS. He receives his ANRP award today for the paper uh, you see on the slide, uh, Scale Automatically Finding RFC Compliance Bugs in DNS Name Servers, which was ori originally published in the Us Usenix NSDI 2022 conference. Shiva, uh, over to you. Thank you for the warm introduction, Colin. And good day, everyone. Today, I will be presenting a method we have developed to automatically check whether implementations comply with the specifications outlined in the RFCs. This research was part of my doctoral studies at UCLA with my advisors, Professor Todd Milstein and George Wattis, and in collaboration with Ryan Beckett from Microsoft. The domain name system, or DNS, is a critical but often overlooked component of the internet's infrastructure. You can think of it as an indispensable adhesive that keeps the various elements of the internet cohesively interconnected. 
Essentially, DNS is the mechanism that translates the names of websites or services into their corresponding IP addresses. For instance, if you want to visit the IETF website, it is DNS that seamlessly translates IETF.org into an IP address that allows your computer to connect their service. The DNS landscape is broad with multiple implementations. We have a variety of open source implementations and each cloud service features its unique DNS system. DNS software needs to be absolutely correct. When DNS does not work, or when you get a wrong response, or the software is vulnerable to being attacked by malicious parties, this can have dire real-world consequences. You lose connectivity worldwide, so DNS has a very unfortunate property of what we call having a large blast radius. This isn't hypothetical. Regularly, security advisories alert users to critical vulnerabilities, urging users to upgrade to secure versions. High profile outages often reported in the news are testament to DNS issues. You can take the recent uh, Slack downtime, uh, downtime, for instance, caused by nuanced glitch in Amazon Route 53's DNS handling of wildcards with DNSSEC, which had widespread repercussions. Thus, the imperative is clear DNS software must be virtually flawless. Before we uh, before we delve into our project objectives, I will quickly walk through the process of DNS resolution using Microsoft website as an example. Imagine a user that wants to visit Microsoft.com. They start the query. They start by sending the query to the local resolver, which is often provided by their ISP. The resolver first contacts a root name server. There are several of them. Each name server uses a zone file to guide its responses to queries. For illustration purposes, let's say our query reaches the second root name server. This server does not know the IP address for Microsoft.com, but it knows how to find .com servers and it informs that to the resolver. And this step-by-step -step process continues until the query arrives at the name server that knows the specific IP address for Microsoft.com. The IP is then relayed back to the resolver and finally to the user and which finally enables the user to access the desired web server. All this may appear like a simple process, but DNS is significantly way more complex than people realize. At its core, DNS is an intricate string rewriting system, and its complexity comes from two main sources. First, there is no determinism. In the example that I gave, we follow a single path of resolution, but in reality, a query might traverse numerous different name server paths. Secondly, the complexity is compounded by the mirror of record types. There are partial rewrites like DNAME, complete rewrites like CNAME, wildcard records that cover un, uh, unaddressed queries, and around 60 other types of records spread across approximately 30 RFCs. To encapsulate the nature of DNS succinctly, I'm reminded of Jeff Houston's comparison to chess simple in the rules that govern it, but profoundly complex in the way in its execution. So our project's aim is to ensure that DNS software adheres to standards set by RFCs. To achieve this, we have developed a method to automatically generate test cases that encompass the behaviors dictated by the RFCs. The crux of the challenge lies in the fact that a proper test case in DNS is not merely just an input query, but it also includes a DNS name server configuration file and gets it in a zone file. Before we delve into the intricacies of our methodology, I will first outline what constitutes a DNS test, why crafting effective tests is a complex task, and I will illustrate this with an impactful test our tool created, which led to a crash and bind and extensively utilized DNS software. I would like to showcase a test case that was entirely auto-generated by our tools. Every test is composed of two fundamental components. The first is the zone file, which holds a suite of uh, resource records defining the rules for handling queries. These records come in diverse forms and can be interdependent. Zone files are not just lists of records, they are structured with strict syntactic and semantic uh, rules to be well formed. The second component, which we all know is the query itself, characterized by a domain name and a record type. Now, 
when the uh, pine server process it query using this specific zone file, it leads to a crash. What appears to be a straightforward test case here is actually a complex web of dependencies, all of which must be aligned perfectly to trigger the server failure. First, there should be a DNA record in the zone file. Second, that DNA record should rewrite uh, to the parent domain. The DNA record's purpose is to rewrite any query ending with foo.attack.com to simply end with com. Next, for the crash to occur, the query itself must also be specifically for a DNA record. The final and more complex criterion is the structure of the query name. It must include the substring foo.attack at least twice, and the query must uh, end with com. We discovered that this precise query combination triggers an assertion failure in the bind server, causing it to crash. Bind identified this vulnerability as a highly exploitable denial of service uh, risk due to its simplicity in execution. Moving forward, we will explore scenarios demonstrating how an attacker could leverage this failed assertion, remote, assertion check to remotely exploit the uh, bind server. In the first scenario, DNS hosting services using binds authority to name server implementation are vulnerable to this attack. An attacker can exploit this vulnerability by uploading the problematic zone file to the authority to server through the hosting service platform. Typically, a hosting service will replicate this uh, zone file across multiple servers to ensure redundancy. And then when the crafted query we discussed is requested, it causes the server instances to crash. Given that such instances often handle zone files for many other customers, a single crash can disrupt service for all those relying on those particular name servers. This flaw therefore provides attackers with a straightforward and remote method to launch a denial of service attack with significant repercussions for all customers hosted on the affected service. We will explore a second a more alarming scenario where any public bind-based resolver can be compromised. Public resolvers like 1.1.1 or 8.8.8 fetch and cache data to respond to users uh, quickly. In this type of attack, the attacker has control over an authoritative name server that hosts a zone file containing the dname record. And then here is how the attack unfolds. The attacker first makes a query for the dname record to the public bind resolver. The resolver queries the name server and retrieves the record. And then it caches the DNA record from the attacker's authority to name server to efficiently respond to any subsequent queries. It returns the DNA record to the attacker. Then they send the uh, uh, specially crafted query that interacts with the cache to record. And this causes the resolver to crash. If you consider uh, binds prevalence, which estimates around like more than half of all DNS resolvers are using bind, this vulnerability exposes significant risk. Attackers potentially orchestrate a distributed DNS of service attack with relative ease, targeting a multitude of ISPs and public resolvers used by the general population. Upon identifying DNA vulnerability and these two scenarios, we engage in a resp uh, responsible disclosure process with the bind development team. Due to the critical nature of the attack, the developers asked us for confidentiality until a patch could be prepared and distributed. Subsequently, Bind issued a CVE with high severity classification and urged all users to update their software. This vulnerability was present in all supported versions of Bind, impacting major distributions and vendors including NetApp, Ubuntu, Infobox, and Red Hat. I believe with this example, I convince you that DNS testing requires a synchronized generation of both zone files and also queries to effectively reach and test the server's resolution logic. Given the complexity of the zone file and the query, the necessity for automated test generation becomes evident. Before I dive into our approach of automated test generation, I will explain why conventional automated testing tools fall short in addressing this unique challenge. Traditional automated testing techniques, we have first testing, 
which inundates a program with random inputs. And it has been successful for many code bases. However, they fall short for DNS testing as they cannot adaptively navigate the intricacy structure of zone files, limiting their ability to test the core query lookup logic. And also, fuzzing lacks coverage guarantees. The figure on the uh, slide shows expected tested parts of implementation in red using fuzzing. And on the other side of the standard automated testing, we have symbolic execution, which traces program execution paths to generate comprehensive tests. While it is theoretically covers, uh, uh, while it theoretically offers coverage guarantees, practical limitations like path explosion hinder its uh, scalability and effectiveness especially with complex data structures and logic found in DNS. Both techniques fail to generate the necessary zone files and therefore miss RFC violations, highlighting the need for a more sophisticated approach to DNS testing. We have developed a new automated testing method called SCALE, or small scope constraint driven automated logical execution for DNS name server RFC compliance. Scales breakthrough lies in its capacity to co generate zone files and matching queries. This targeted approach is designed to extensively cover varied RFC behaviors and is applicable to black box DNS implementations. So, what was the key insight that enabled all of this? Well, unlike typical software, network protocols benefit from detailed specifications, although they are described in natural language. So we leverage our prior work group and we harness a DNS formal model derived directly from the RFCs to state the test generation process in scale. We have transformed the formal semantics of DNS into an executable model. Through symbolic execution of this model, we were able to generate comprehensive tests, each comprising a correctly structured zone file and a targeted query. These tests are crafted to probe distinct RFC behaviors. This methodological approach enables us to thoroughly explore the logical space of RFC defined behaviors, ensuring extensive coverage of the RFC behaviors. We have applied the scale framework to create Ferret, a specialized tool for the automated testing of DNS implementations. Ferret exhaustively generates test cases, which are composed of zone files and query pairs guided by a logical model derived from the DNS RFCs. Given these tests, what we do, do, what we do then is run every name server implementation we have against the test and compare their outputs. Discrepancies in responses signal potential deviations from RFC specifications, which Ferret identifies for further investigation. This approach accounts for the ambiguities and gray areas within DNS RFCs, where definitive answers are not always established. By adopting differential testing, a technique frequently used in compiler verification, we cross-reference the behavior of various implementations to pinpoint inconsistencies. I'm not going to dive, uh, delve deeper into the specifics of Ferret test generation module. We start with the formal model we have from our prior work. Roughly, you can think of this formal as a very complex gestion tree that the DNS goes through in order to answer a query. I'm showing a highly abstracted version of the formal semantics as a DNS uh, as a gestion tree for a subset of the DNS logic on a slide here. So, for example, if you first look at for an exact match at the top of the tree and then go left or right, depending on if this exists. With the decision tree as our guide, we systematically explore every possible path through the uh, tree. Each path corresponds with a set, uh, unique set of con con conditions that the query and zone file must satisfy. We solve this set of constraints using a constraint solver to find inputs that meet each of these constraints. So this is basically symbolic execution of the model. If performed manually, this process would be both labor intensive and prone to error. Thankfully, the process is streamlined by Zen, a tool developed by Ryan Beckett at Microsoft. Zen enables us to codify our formal model in an executable format 
which in turn automates symbolic execution process. And the result is a set of uh, tests, which are a pair of zone file and queries, one, one for each unique path in the model. Up next, I will delve into one of the key challenges we faced in developing this tool. The main hurdle was to ensure that the zone file generated by Zen were valid. We encountered issues where individual records, like each resource record was valid, but the zone as a whole was not valid due to multiple constraints depending on the DNS RFCs. For instance, there can be only one DNAM record in a uh, zone file for a given domain name. The DNS RFCs define many such constraints to eliminate ambiguous or useless zone files. Naively performing symbolic execution will produce many zone files that are not well formed and DNS implementations typically pre-process to reject ill-formed zone files, thereby failing to test the internet execution path of the query lookup logic. Our scale approach admits a natural solution to this problem. We have formalized DNS zone validity conditions as predicates in Z. Whenever Z symbolic execution engine produces constraints for a particular execution path, we co-join these predicates before Zen passes it off to an automated constraint solver. And the result is a uh, valid zone for inputs. While it is critical to be able to generate well-formed zone files for testing, bugs can also lurk in the implementation's handling of ill-formed zone files. Since we have formulated validity conditions for zone files, we leverage Zen to systematically generate zone files that violate one of these uh, zone validity conditions. The use of a small scope property in testing is a strategic choice that enables more manageable and efficient test generation. By considering the complexity of the test, such as limiting the length of domain names and the number of records in a zone to a maximum of four, the testing process remains rigorous yet feasible. This method of testing DNS implementations has produced around 12,600 tests that are comprehensive within the set bounds, confirming that significant coverage can be achieved with a relatively small test. This approach validates the small scope hypothesis, demonstrating that a large spectrum of behaviors within DNS implementations can be effectively probed with limited yet carefully constructed scenarios. We found that 8,000 tests showed uh, some differences among implementations. And this is a lot of test cases to go through manually to figure out what went wrong. We realized that there can be orders of magnitude fewer root causes than failed tests. So as a final step, we provide a simple but effective technique to help users with bug deduplication. We create a hybrid fingerprint for each test which combines information from the test pass in the Zen model with the results of differential testing, and then group tests by fingerprint per user inspection. So if you look at the example fingerprint here, R1 is from the Zen program path, and the remaining is from the differential testing. This idea is generally used in intrusion detection systems, but not for triaging bugs. Our fingerprinting technique reduces the failed cases to a manageable 75 groups per further examination. Our evaluation included eight DNS names of implementations ranging from the well-known bind uh, to the Kubernetes favorite core DNS. Each implementation had at least one detected bug with varying severity levels. Interestingly, the maturity of the DNS software did not predict the number of bugs. For instance, bind had four issues, including a severe vulnerability. Less mature name servers like Edifa and Trust DNS had multiple issues, but our focus was on critical bugs. The majority of the identified bugs across the first five top implementations have been resolved. Using Ferret, I integrated this 12K test into Amazon's Route 53 DNS CACD pipeline, revealing bugs and enhanced the testing process there. I cannot reveal the specifics, specifics remains confidential there. As a final example, I will give one example uh, zone file that crashed code DNS a DNS, uh, a DNS combination that is frequently used in Kubernetes. 
The query matches the wildcard CNAME, which rewrites the query to foo.example. The rewritten query will match uh, the wildcard record again and so on, causing code DNS to loop and consume resources until eventually the server crashes with the following message. An attacker could potentially upload zone files that exploit a vulnerability like this one, compromise the service by crashing the provided services, servers. I presented this work at a DNS-specific conference called DNS Org, and it was well received by the DNS community. To summarize scale, the main technical challenge is to jointly generate the structured configuration zone files, as well as the input queries to check RFC behavior compliance. We leverage the small scope property of DNS to build an executable model of DNS resolution with symbolic execution in mind and symbolically executed to generate high coverage tests that cover all parts in the model. Using these tests, we found 30 bugs, including three critical security vulnerabilities. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, thank you. All right, we've got time for one or two questions, uh, for Wes. Uh, thank you, Wes Hardiker from ISI. I'm on the ICANN board and also on the Internet Architecture board. And I think from all of my positions, I'd like to say thank you for working so diligently to you know, help protect the DNS ecosystem. I think your, your contributions are absolutely fantastic. From a question point of view, um, it's clear you have you have figured out that all of your test cases completely map to your model, so your coverage is very good. Um, my remaining question is, do you have any confidence that your model actually covers everything you know, really well? You didn't describe how you actually built your model from the RFCs super well. That is, it's a hard labor. So we did it manually back in 2020. So I manually went through DNS RFCs, read them, and then we built a mathematical model. And then we used the model for the test generation process here. Uh, Jim. Jim Reed, a DNS guy. Um, I think this is great work, so congratulations to you and your colleagues for this stuff. I'm glad to see that there's a much more systematic way of trying to do DNS testing, so fair play to you for all that. Um, I've got a couple of questions or comments, though. The first one is that you found a lot of bugs in DNS software, which is good but they don't seem to be from the information you presented here as about issues about RFC compliance. It looks to be more like implementation bugs or problems with the software rather than something that's faulty within the RFCs that's a result of causing these failures. And the second point I was going to make has kind of gone out of my head just now, so I'll leave you time to answer that one for now. So the the, the reason those bugs existed is because we expected, according to RFC, that if there is a DNA record, this is how the implementation should respond. And that our model generated a test case showing that if there is a DNA, and this is the expected response. But when you actually run those test cases on the implementations, then bind or coordinates respond in a different way compared to the others. So that's how it's an RFC compliance bug in a sense. If there is a DNA record, this is how you should respond, but you crash instead of responding to that. Uh, and okay. that's how we define an RFC. Yeah. Okay, that's right. Thanks. And I've now remembered the second point that I wanted to make, which is related a little bit to what Wes just asked a moment or two ago. A lot of the problem with the DNS RFCs just now, particularly the early ones, is there's somewhat vague about things. And I think it's kind of difficult to use those to make some kind of formal method for a testing approach. And we've found this sort of thing time and time again. For example, when DNSSEC was being developed, we realized there were a number of gaps in how RFC 1035 could be implemented. And we sort of cleaned some of them up later on. So I wonder what sort of problems you've had trying to develop your models based on particularly the historical DNS related RFCs, which are maybe not good choices to be based on. That's definitely a good question. And the way that some of the way, uh, one way we try to mitigate that issue is using differential testing. So especially if you think of glue records, there is no right answer of when should the glue records be returned and when not. So we were not sure how to ex correctly model that one. So we model in one way and then let the model generate test cases. And then we took all the test cases and compared the response across uh, all the implementations we had. 
if the majority are doing one way and there is one or two implementations that are deviating, then we are like, we just inform the DNS implementations like NSG or Power DNS saying that, oh, bind and not are doing this way. Is this what you want to do or is that the other way around? So that's how we try to mitigate the issue of ambiguities in RSS. Yeah, that's great. I remember some of the early developers of other open source software saying is we don't understand how to implement what's in the RFCs, but we'll just do what Bind did. And so thank you very much. You've done great work and I want to see more of this stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Yes, th thank you. Uh, we are unfortunately out of time for this talk because uh, we, we have a shorter than usual agenda. But thank you again to uh, Shiva. This was a, a fantastic talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Dennis. Do you want me to share the slides or are you bringing them up? I'm just sharing them. Okay, so the, the second talk today is the second talk today is from uh, Dennis Trautwein. Uh, Dennis is a PhD candidate at the University of Göttingen in Germany, and a researcher at Protocol Labs. His research focuses on peer-to-peer -peer networks, uh, information-centric networking, and decentralization. The paper he'll be talking about today, uh, Design and Evaluation of IPFS, uh, a storage layer for the decentralized web, uh, was originally published in the SIGCOM 2022 conference. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you for um, giving me the opportunity to um, present our paper. Um, as you already said, it's called the Design and Evaluation of IPFS, a storage layer for the decentralized yeah. web. Closing? Okay. And I'm here on behalf of all these awesome authors here that I uh, co-authored that paper. So um, what's in today? Um, I will give a brief overview of what IPFS is, um, just to get everyone on the same page. And then I will basically walk you through the paper. So we structured it in two parts. First of all, we gave a design overview of how IPFS is structured and uh, yeah, well designed. And then we did a measurement campaign, measurement study, and evaluated this design. And at the end, um, yeah, I will give some pointers where to go uh, from here, because this will only be an overview. All right, so what is IPFS? Um, IPFS stands for the Interplanetary File System, and the IPFS stack is very abstractly um, a suite of specifications and tools that share two key characteristics, which are content addressing using CIDs, and CID here stands for uh, Content Identifiers, and Transport Agnosticity. And uh, basic, so IPFS is basically the um, space of resources that can be interacted with using CIDs over arbitrary transports. And judging from some hallway discussions I had the last couple of days, I th should have put this bottom footnote there a little larger. Um, so IPFS is not a blockchain and is not using a blockchain and doesn't need a blockchain. So just to get this clear. Um, because of this very abstract definition, um, there are actually plenty of implementations of this IPFS specification. Um, everyone who has used IPFS in the past probably has interacted with or probably has used Kubo mainly. Um, which was formerly called uh, Go IPFS, um, but there are also other implementations. One uh, notable one is Helia, which is the JavaScript implementation. And IPFS is operational since 2015. Um, there are around 300,000 unique nodes identified by IP addresses in the network each week. Um, we see 3 million users per day uh, using IPFS and uh, 120 million requests per day. But this, um, you can consider this the lower bound. Uh, because this is just from our vantage point and a decentralized network uh, is, is hard to get by with numbers, uh, like to get comprehensive numbers. All right, um, so how is IPFS designed? So what are the core principles? Um, the core, like the, the primary thing is, well, content addressing. And simplistically, IPFS uses the hash of the content stored in the system as its content identifier. And you can see one of, uh, one of these identifiers there uh, in the center of the slide. 
Um, but in practice, um, it's much, much more sophisticated than just the hash of the content. Uh, so this CID that you can see there co actually consists of quite some metadata. And so it starts with the multi-base, which is just the, the prefix that defines how the rest of the CID is encoded. And then the CID itself consists of a version prefix. So right now we have version zero, which is just implicit and version one, the multi-codec, which describes how the data itself is encoded. And then a multi-hash, which again is a self-describing hash that consists of the hash function, like the metadata of which hash function was used, how long the hash digest is, and finally the actual hash digest. So all this metadata is encoded in this in the CID here. And with content addressing, there come some well-known advantages, but also challenges. So this is probably not new. So I just, I don't claim this is comprehensive, but um, so content addressing decouples the content from their hosts. So anyone can serve content to, to you and uh, you don't need to trust the server that the content that you've received is actually the one that you requested because you can just hash the content and match it against the CID that you requested. You get data integrity out of the box because of this hashing scheme. Data deep duplication is also something uh, that often is, um, is, is an advantage in this case. And uh, the last point that I have here is alleviate backbone addiction. So one nice example is so if all of us were to download a YouTube video, for example, uh, which is, I don't know, half a mech in size, uh, we would put quite some pressure on the link to YouTube servers. Wouldn't it be nicer if we just downloaded it once in this room and could share it among each other? Um, I'm not saying IPFS is doing this, but in theory, content addressing would um, make it, I think, a little, it could, could be the, uh, uh, yeah, the vehicle here. Um, but yeah, so the challenge here, in the, especially in this example, is as well the, the discoverability. So how do I know that someone else is actually um, hosting this content? And also uh, access control, which is usually solved by um, some elaborate encryption schemes of the data that is stored uh, with IPFS. But talking about discoverability, um, this is probably the core thing or core interesting thing next to the um, content addressing itself. Um, IPFS uses a cadenia based at DHT. So DHT here is a distributed hash table. Um, for everyone who do doesn't know what the DHT is, it's just a distributed key value store, simplistically, where the key space is just shared uh, or distributed among all the nodes in the network. And uh, everyone is just responsible for a small, small part of the key space. And so this enables the system to be open and permissionless. And the two types of records that are interesting um, for now uh, and that are stored in this distributed hash table are the provider records, which map CIDs, so content identifiers to peer identifiers. So every node in the, or every peer in the network, when they join the network, generate a public private key pair. And the peer ID is again, simplistically, just the hash of the public key. And then the peer records map the peer IDs to the actual network addresses, which uh, can then be used to connect to that peer and request the actual content. So two a two-step process. But yeah, to make it a bit more um, concrete, let's imagine I want to share a file um, like from my last summer vacation with a friend. So the content lifecycle would look as follows. So I would add this file to my local IPFS installation. We can assume this is Kubo for now. Kubo will give me um, the content identifier. And what, what Kubo will then do is it will look in its routing table, which is a concept of this Kademnia DHT, and try to um, identify the closest peer in this DHT network to this content identifier. And closeness here is not in geographical terms, but in this key space um, that this Kademnia DHT is using. And so we arrive at a single, well, we, we arrive at a node that is um, like responsible for this particular key space, and we store this provider record, which maps the CID to the peer identity, uh, peer, peer ID. And then I will pass off band the CID to my friend. And what they will do first is actually contact their immediately connected peers and opportunistically ask them, hey, do you have the content? Um, because in this peer-to-peer -peer network, Kubo is actually connected to sometimes a dozen, sometimes a few hundred peers at a time. And so we just opt opportunistically ask them, hey, do you have the content? Let's assume this is like the, the reply is negative. So what will happen now, the, uh, my friend will do the same DHT walk, how we call it, um, to find the same part of the key space that is responsible for the CID. We'll find the provider record, request it and download this provider record. And uh, we'll actually do the same steps for the peer ID, for the peer record, which is then uh, contained in the provider record. And finally, it's able to connect to me 
and download the data. So this is how the content lifecycle works. And there are two important things to point out and take away. The first thing is no data is uploaded anywhere. So, well, uh, besides the provider record. So this is a common misconception. Um, so this photo from my summer vacation actually stays on my machine and I'm not uploading it to the IPFS network. So it stays with me. At the same time, if I went down and someone else in the network would host the content, um, my friend could just download it from them and wouldn't even need to trust that um, they will just that, that, that they will receive the correct photo because of this content um, content addressing scheme. So there's this is like a trustless setup in this case, which is quite neat. All right. And so after we've covered in the paper the design of IPFS, we thought so. Um, so you cannot improve something if you if you don't measure it as what you want to improve. So we did an enlarged evaluation and measurement campaign, and we employed three uh, measurement methodologies that complement each other, and we tried to cover as much of the operational spectrum as possible. So we were doing network crawls. So we were crawling the um, the HT network. We were uh, running, or we have deployed network probes, which are just controlled nodes in the network in different geographical locations to measure the performance of um, retrievals and publications. And finally, we were looking at infrastructure logs, which is not in this presentation because there's a, um, something that I left out so far is there's a bridge between like the location address world, which is HTTP and this IPFS content address world um, because the Kubo, um, <coughs> insula or the, a Kubo instance has like, a, or exposes a HTTP gateway where you can just pass the CID as a path component and then the background, Kubo will go ahead and resolve the CID in the IPFS network and just serve it over HTTP. You lose some, some nice properties there, but um, this is uh, just a bridge. And Protocol Labs is operating these, uh, these gateways, and we had access to these logs, and uh, yeah, we were able to analyze them. But yeah, um, for context, um, the, uh, we did this measurement campaign in this time frame. So we have on the x-axis the time in 2021 and leading into 2022. And on the x, sorry, on the y-axis the number of peers or peer IDs that we have found in the network based on our network crawls. And the blue line is the total number of peer IDs that we found in the network. Then the green line is the ones that were actually reachable. And the black lines are the ones um, that we couldn't reach, couldn't contact because of various reasons. And for all these three measurement methodologies, we um, have a shaded area here. Um, so for example, this blue shaded area is a detailed analysis of our crawls, which we did in our paper. Then gateway data is, is a, the gateway data is from early 2022. And then a little later, we've um, performed this DHT performance measurement. And the takeaway from this slide is basically um, the network is a moving target. So when, uh, as you can already see in this time frame the network has grown in size by 50% by the end uh, of the uh, of this measurement campaign. And uh, so keep, keep this in mind when we see these numbers, but I will point it out as well. So starting with the network crawls, um, we, so in our paper, we did for this whole time frame uh, a full network crawl every 30 minutes, uh, which uh, added up to around nine and a half thousand crawls um, over this period of time. And um, in this, Blue shaded area, which was October 2021, we identified around 464,000 unique IP addresses uh, from over 150 countries in over 2,700 ASs. And this AS distribution is also in this chart in the, in the center here with the autonomous system rank based on the Kaida ranking system on the x-axis and the number of IP addresses that we found in this AS. And what we've seen is um, quite some centralization here because the top five ASs actually hosted more than 50% of IP addresses. So this is just one takeaway from here. Um, but I also want to point out to some fellow researchers um, which gave it, uh, who gave it, like they gave a talk at the beginning of the week, the cloud strikes back, which looked more uh, in more detail into the cloud dependence uh, of the IPFS networks. Um, what we can also do with um, our crawl measurements is um, measure the peer churn. So this means how, how long do, so when a peer joins the network, how long do they stay in the network before they churn? So go out of the network, go offline again, which influences several network-wide DHT parameters like record replication, for example, um, because if the peer churn is high, we want to replicate these records, these provider records as in probably more peers um, to keep them uh, alive in the network or routing table refresh rates, which again is like a concept from this Kademia DHT. 
And uh, so here we have on the x-axis the uptime in hours, and then how long these on the y-axis, how long uh, which percentage of peers stayed that long in the network. And in this example, we can see that for um, peers in from Germany uh, stayed in the network for 70% uh, of peers stayed for four hours or less uh, online from Germany, for example. This is from 2021. On the right-hand side, I have the same graph, but not split by countries, but overall for, um, I think it's last week or the week before. And what we can see here is, um, it's probably a little too small, but the takeaway here would be, it hasn't really changed over the last two years. At the same time, um, what these graph, graphs don't show is the number of very stable peers. So this baseline of very, very stable peers that um, participate in the network, they don't show up in these graphs because they just don't churn. So um, on the right-hand side, which is from, yeah, as I said, one or two weeks ago, um, we have like a, a baseline of stable peers of 85 to 90%. So this is the amount of peers that are actually super stable, while in 2021, this was only around 55 to 60%. Um, yeah, so this is something that has changed. Um, then, as I said, we've deployed some network probes to measure the DHT performance. And um, so we, we deployed in seven different AWS regions, a, a, a Kubo instance, and in turn instructed a single instance to write a provider record or yeah, to, to publish content in the DHT and then instruct all the other nodes to actually uh, to, to retrieve this data. So in this case, AF South one has published some data and then we instructed all the other nodes to retrieve the data. Then next round, EU Central publishes a piece of content and we instructed all the other ones to retrieve the data. And in this process, we collected latency measurements and so on and so forth. And in to total, we published around 3,000 CIDs and 14,000 CIDs were retrieved uh, then afterwards. And this is all random data, so no one else in the, in the network should actually know of that data. So no caching or so go is going on. And looking up data in the in the network actually consists of, as I said, looking up the actual network addresses with this provider and peer records, and then finally connecting to the peer and downloading it. The first part of identifying these records is in the middle. This the actual download or the content exchange is on the right, and the total um, duration that the users would experience is on the very left. And here we have the um, duration in seconds or the latency uh, on the x-axis and then the CDF again on the, on the y-axis across these different regions. And so what we found back then is that 80% of requests from, in this case, the EU resolve in under 500 milliseconds. And I'm pointing the central, central part out because this is, this is the, I would call it the cost of decentralization because this is something that on, in the location-based address world, we just don't have to do because we know the address right away. Well, maybe. DNS, but uh, yeah, so this is just the overhead of decentralization, how I would call it. All right. Um, ah, sorry. And so I don't have as much experience, but from what I've heard, this is actually um, pretty fast for unstructured and permissionless DHT networks. Um, but I'm happy to, he <laughs> to hear something else from, from, from the audience on that. On the flip side, publishing data is uh, orders of magnitudes worse. So um, publication latency is, is orders of magnitude worse, especially two years ago. Um, this is on the left-hand side. We again have the duration in seconds on the x-axis and the CDF on the y-axis. And we can see that it took around, it, it can take up to two minutes to actually publish data into, into the network, which is, especially for delay intolerant or delayed sensitive applications, probably nothing. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's not, not good and it, IPFS couldn't be used in these cases. This has improved. Um, so on the right-hand side, this is also from uh, last week, uh, some data. Um, there, the median publication time is around six or seven seconds. And again, this is due to this stable baseline of, of nodes that uh, support the network uh, today, as opposed to two years ago. And with that, there's much more. So a cliffhanger um, in our paper, so we have I only covered content addressing and uh, content lifecycle in, in, in my presentation now, but there's much more to the design of IPFS, which is in our paper. As I said, the public gateway usage logs are also interesting to look at. We looked at cloud provider dependence with this caveat and this pointer to these fellow researchers. We looked at geographical distribution as well and specifically compared HTTPS performance to IPFS retrieval performance and called it request stretch um, that we defined there. 
And with that, uh, where to go from here, we've published all our data in uh, on, well, on IPFS, you can download it. And I think, although I mentioned that these IPFS is moving target, there are some time insensitive uh, analysis you, you can do. Um, so if you're interested, use our data sets. Um, some call outs, so we are not operating in a vacuum and we have some other fellow researchers who look, who are not affiliated with Protocol Labs as I am, who, are, who is one of the main contributors to IPFS. Uh, so I want to point out their their work as well, which is uh, which have done yeah. So they have done great work there. And finally, um, I'm part of Probe Lab within Protocol Labs, and we figured again, IPFS is a moving target. We should probably continuously measure what is going on in the network. And all the graphs that are more up to date that you've seen in these slides are from our website. So check that out. And uh, we publish weekly reports on the IPFS uh, network on stats stats.ipfs.network. And well, there's a myriad of so there's plenty of future work that we could do. And um, for example, content availability is something uh, that could be looked into. Um, severe network conditions is something I think no one has yet looked into. And um, yeah, content routing latency is still not satisfactory, I believe, for quite a few delay sensitive applications. And all the measurements tool tools that we've built. Um, I actually built on top of lib P2P, a generic networking stack, and they can also be applied to different P2P networks, which, which are not IPFS. So broaden focus and making a comparative, a comparative study is also something. And all the tools are also open source linked from our website. And yeah, with that, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have a couple of minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Questions for us. John Levine. Yeah, thank this is interesting. I was wondering if you were able to characterize what sort of places people are storing the data. You know, are they at hosting providers or random, you know, <coughs> random cable modems or what? You mean so where the data actually is stored? Yeah. So is, is it, whether it's in the cloud or, for example, in uh, on home computers? Well, I mean, it's all in the cloud, but sort of like what bits of the cloud? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so in this particular study, we haven't looked at the content itself, and uh, this very question was one of the leftover questions from the study. And again, one of the other researchers looked into exactly that. Um, so like, come, come back next year. Come back next year when <laughs> when they may, might be here as well. So, so it's not it's not our paper that that I'm. Um, it's just hang on. Um, this is the IMC paper. Yeah, this is the IMC paper at the bottom right. They looked at, at exactly this question um, because this was one of the, as I said, leftover ones. Uh, from, well, from from our paper. I'm, okay. I'm not saying because, but yeah, yeah, this was just not not covered in our paper. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So I guess one from me. Um, I mean, you know, this is a content address system. Um, it, does does that have any implications for privacy and being able to trace you know, who's looking at what content? And is, yes. is there any mechanisms to uh, uh, sort of help with that? Yes. So there are some some um, yes some big implications. And let me go back a few slides here. Especially this first this first step from this example that I have with my, when my friend is asking their immediate neighbors. So they're basically give, giving away what they are interested in. Um, so they have brought, so as I said, Google is usually connected to a few dozen to a few hundred nodes. And the first step that they do is broadcast to all of these nodes, hey, I'm interested in this CID. And this, this, is, this has definitely privacy implications. Um, similarly, these provider records also have the CID in plain text, and there's some efforts right now to um, enable reader privacy. And there are concepts of uh, employing private set intersection with this first in, in this first step, for example. And um, for provider records, we thought of um, doubly hashing the CIDs and just request um, the yeah the hash of the of the hash basically. Okay, but yeah, it's, but there are implications, certainly. Yeah, yeah, important. Let's put this work underway. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, Georgia. Hi, Georgia Osborne, um, DNS Research Federation. I'm new and not too confident with um, my wording here. Um, so, just on the same content question, 
So it's peer to peer and it goes through different peers. Does that mean that the content that is distributed, all peers are responsible for that content? So if it is something kind of, let's say that it's um, illegal content, does that mean everyone is responsible for that illegal content? Well, as I also said here, so the illegal content will stay on your machine. Um, st still, if you're participating in this DHT, you would probably help out with this illegal content by hosting these provider records, which, which would point to the person who's hosting the malicious content, for, for example. So this would be, uh, yeah, this would be the, the, the problematic part here. But to answer your question, you, so no one else would host your content unless you instruct your, 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 your local installation to, to do that. Uh, um, uh, 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 sorry. Thank you, Ayub <laughs> uh, Mishus, uh, Research of Europe. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, brief question: How do you um, justify or explain the improved performances that you showed? Maybe in the next slide, later on. Uh, you mean the, la uh, the last one, I think, in the, the one that you showed the graphs. Uh, yeah, this that one. one? Yeah. It's like a huge improvement in performances. Mm -hmm. How do you explain that? Right. Um, curiosity, I guess. So, so when, when you, so in, in, in my slides earlier, I showed that I'm storing this provider record with, with just a single peer. But in reality, I'm storing it with 20 peers to combat this peer churn that I mentioned. So um, you're, uh, so I'm, I'm trying to identify the 20 closest peers to a certain uh, CID. And if, if the share of peers that are undialable, so, I, so, so my reason here was uh, two years ago, Peers, there was a significant fraction of the peers that are actually not reachable, and now this fraction is significantly lower. So when you try to publish something into the DH or write something into the DHT, you will run into these undialable peers super often, and then you try to contact this particular peer, and then you will time out. Then you contact the next one, and you will time out. This will just happen very frequently when the share of undialable peers in the network is high. And on the right-hand side, so which is just as I said, one or two weeks ago, the share of unreachable peers is in the order of 10, 10 to 15, maybe yeah, maybe only 10%. And this will happen much less frequent. You will, you will time out less frequently. And this is the reason why the, yeah, why this publication time is much lower. Quick, thank you. A uh, quick follow-up. Uh, if we change, uh, I, I would say the peer network and use uh, other uh, resources that are farther away, how do how would that impact these performances? What what do you mean with further away? Because uh, most of the, the resources are, were in Europe, I guess, for your test. Um, right. Um, so so, the, so so when when I mean closer, just to clarify, when when I mean closer, I'm not meaning like geographically close, but in key space. Closer. Ah, okay. 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 Then I missed that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one last question, Sean uh, Frost. Um, hi, Jean Francois from the Air Foundation. Uh, could you go back to the slide where you were um, discussing about the 20 different implementations? In, in the, the very first slide? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Take some time, sorry. It's all right. <laughs> Almost there. That one? Okay, yeah. So, Lotus, that um, logo over there, that's Filecoin, right? Right. Okay, so. Could you tell us a little bit of the difference of their implementation since they are block, blockchain based? Right. As opposed to. Right. Yeah. So they, and that, that, that's totally right. And um, so, so this is just with this very abstract implement, uh, specification here, or like with this abstract definition of what IPFS is, this will definitely also fall under this, under this umbrella of being IPFS. Though I mainly, well, I only covered like what the common sense IPFS is, which is the Kubo network that they will interact with. But yeah, Falcon is also using IPFS because it's using CIDs in this sense. And um, actually plenty of peer-to-peer -peer networks in this uh, Web3 decentralized web ecosystem are using CIDs. Um, <coughs> yeah, and so the, these are usually also then IPFS in that sense. But yeah, as I said, so this this definition at the beginning is very very broad, and uh, only CIDs would be the the defining characteristic here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Uh, we're a little short on time, so we have to cut it off there. But thank you again.
All right, so the final speaker today is uh, Ramakrishnan Sundar Raman. Uh, Ram is a, a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan. Uh, his research interests uh, are in network security and privacy. Uh, and his, in, in his research, he uses empirical methods to detect, analyze, and prevent large-scale security threats to the security and privacy of internet users. He's particularly interested in the study of internet censorship and leads work on the Censored Planet Observatory, uh, a global censorship measurement platform. Um, his uh, talk today uh, is uh, on uh, network measurement methods for locating and uh, examining censorship devices. Uh, it was originally published in the Proceedings of ACM Conex uh, 2022. Uh, and uh, I understand he's on the academic job market, so if you like the work, yeah, you know what to do. Ram, over to you. Uh, Share it from here instead. Mm. Just, just say next slide. Okay. Um, sorry, I guess I had some animations loaded that I thought would work, but um, you know, now you're using a PDF, so it won't. Uh, but yeah, thank you, Colin, for that introduction. And you know, I want to say first off, thank you for the. Um, NRP committee, the ARTF, and all the sponsors for giving me this award. Um, this is uh, joint work with uh, Mona and Jonathan from Princeton, Jacob from the Citizen Lab, and Roya from Michigan. Um, and in this work, we were trying to uh, study the or examine the technology that performs internet censorship. Next slide, please. Right. So in the past decade, we've seen um, you know censorship and surveillance events of unprecedented scale, such as the throttling of Twitter in Russia and the blocking of social media websites in Iran that's currently active now. And these censorship events are made possible by what is today a very sophisticated deep packet inspection technology that is available on network devices. Um, these devices um, um, can inspect and filter large amounts of internet traffic. And the increasing commoditization of this technology has made it um, available to most governments and ISPs worldwide. Next slide, please. So research from the amazing internet freedom community has shown that studying network devices and understanding their use can lead to positive changes for internet freedom. So for instance, research from our collaborators, the Citizen Lab, um, showed that the uh, Canadian filtering vendor NetSweeper, um, their devices were being used by um, many ISPs in different countries uh, for blocking access to LGBTQ content. And upon advocacy based on Citizen Lab's findings, Let's see if we actually remove the option to block websites based on this category. So we can clearly see that this has led to some positive changes. But even, even uh, despite the success, um, these studies have been few and far apart in the past. Next slide, please. And this is because most censorship studies have understand, understandably focused on what content is blocked from which locations. So um, there are censorship measurement platforms like uh, Uni and Sensor Planet, which we operate in our lab that could tell you right now whether a client in Prague is able to have access to YouTube. Next slide, please. But what we are interested in is uh, learning more about the technical implementation of censorship itself. So things like where it's located, um, who's manufacturing these devices, um, how is it behaving? And previous studies on the subject have focused explicitly on specific censorship systems whose behavior is very well known, such as the Great Firewall. Next slide, please. And this focus on specific uh, systems is because of um, a set of challenges that are associated with studying network devices more broadly. So this includes the fact that understandably there is very little transparency in the world of censorship, both from the devices, uh, the vendors of these devices as well as the actors that deploy them. There are also a large variety of censorship mechanisms that make monitoring really hard. 
And finally, you know, research such as that performed in Citizen Lab involves a lot of forensic manual work, which is really hard to scale. Next slide. So what the community needs right now is a set of general purpose, robust, and reusable methods to study these censorship devices. Next, next slide. So this is exactly what we set out to do. So we built uh, general purpose tools for studying um, specifically three aspects of censorship devices, where they're located, who manufactures these devices, and um, what are their rules and triggers. Next slide. Awesome. So let's start with um, how we can identify censorship devices. So we built, for this purpose, we built a general purpose censorship trace route. Now, trace route is an age old technique that helps, you know, locate the uh, network path between a client and a server uh, by sending packets with incrementing TTL values. And each router on the path will, you know, decrement this TTL value by one. Um, and when it expires, the corresponding router will send back an ICMP time exceeded message. And through that message, we'll know the IP address of the router. So th now we can map the entire path between the client and the server. Um, um, what we are specifically interested in in this case is an application layer trace route that can also carry data on the payload because these HTTP and TLS uh, packets are usually what is the target of censorship. Next slide. So let's consider the same client server environment, but um, now with a censorship device at R3 that blocks censored.com. Next slide. So if we do the same trace route now, um, as long as we don't include censored.com in the payload, we'll see that um, um, that you know the censorship device does not act, and we'll continue to get uh, an ICMP time exceeded message from R3. Next slide. But when we do uh, send censored.com, uh, when the TTL is high enough to reach the censorship device, we expect to see some indication of censorship. But how does this censorship actually manifest? Next slide. Here lies the challenge. The problem is that there, you know, there could be a variety of responses depending on how the device is deployed and how it behaves. And accounting for all of these behaviors forms the core of our trace route mechanism. Next slide. So for instance, um, you know, there are different types of censorship methods. So some devices inject a TCP reset to close connections while others silently drop packets forcing connections to timeout. Next slide. Um, censorship devices could be deployed in different ways. So in-path devices can process packets at line rate and modify traffic, while on-path devices only receive a copy of the traffic, and they can only inject future packets into the connection, uh, hoping that they'll win the race against the legitimate reply. So, there are also problems with you know certain devices try to hide what they're doing actively, and um, some of our measurements could pass through the device while others don't. And you know uh, in 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 our censorship tracer we build explicit mechanisms to deal with each of these challenges. And I'll go through a few examples in today's talk. Okay. So for example, to detect in-path uh, um, injection, uh, we look for uh, a TCP reset at TTL3 and no other accompanying packet, because this shows that the censorship device is in-path because it can prevent the, um, the, the actual packet from going up to the router processing. Next slide. In contrast, uh, if, if the censorship device is deployed on path, then in addition to seeing the TCP reset packet, we'll also see an ICMP time exceeded package from R3 because you know, the packet goes through past the censorship device to the, uh, to the router processing module. Next slide. To look at a different mechanism, if the censorship device is dropping packets, then we'll see no response starting from TTL3 all the way up to any maximum TTL that we use. And finally, you know, um, uh, to, to account for path variance, we actually perform multiple trace routes to build a probabilistic estimate of the uh, path between the client and the server. And then we look inside that to see where the censorship is actually happening. Okay, perfect. So, um, you know, we built our censorship uh, trace route, which we call Centrace. And then um, we performed uh, measurements in four countries specifically for the study. So Azerbaijan, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Russia. And in each of these countries, we performed both HTTP and TLS trace routes. And we performed two types of measurements. The first is uh, in-country measurements where we obtained access to vantage points within these countries and then sent measurements to destinations outside the country, specifically to North America. And we also performed remote measurements to increase the scale because it's really hard to obtain accessible vantage points. So we also perform measurements where we send packets from our vantage point at the University of Michigan to multiple public organizational servers within these countries. And this helped us increase our scale by a lot. Next slide. 
So for each of these cases, we performed um, um, two, two trace routes, one with uh, a possibly censored keyword, let's say censored.com in the payload, and another control trace route with the benign keyword, example.com in the payload. Next slide. And by comparing these two trace routes, we are able to you know, identify the exact location of where censorship is happening. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at a few results from our trace route. Okay, so this figure shows the in-country trace routes that we performed from our vantage point in Kazakhstan. So here, the red arrows show the location of the censorship, and we can see here that the censorship actually happens in the ISP that's immediately upstream to our client. And AS9198 is in fact uh, Kazakh Telecom, the state-owned ISP of Kazakhstan. So this figure shows the remote trace routes that we conducted in Afghanistan, in, in Azerbaijan. So the root node on the left is um, our measurement machine at the University of Michigan. And all of the endpoints on the right are all endpoints in Azerbaijan. And here we can see that the uh, censorship happens on the first hop into the country. So here uh, it's likely at the internet exchange point. Next slide. Uh, this figure shows our remote measurements um, in Belarus, two, two endpoints in Belarus. And here uh, the, we saw that the censorship occurs quite close to the user in uh, a residential ISP. So we're seeing a wide variety of behavior here where the censorship can be implemented. Next slide. Um, this, this, uh, this figure shows uh, the remote measurements that we performed to uh, endpoints in Kazakhstan. So there are two interesting things here. One is that most censorship happens, again, quite close to the user, but in an upstream ISP. But we also saw some cases of censorship where it happens way before the endpoint. Next slide. And when we actually zoom into some of these cases, we can see that the censorship actually happens in a Russian ASP, even though our probes were destined to endpoints in Kazakhstan. So we saw a bunch of cases like this where the censorship policies of ISPs in one country affected traffic going to or from another country. And this has significant implications on how censorship has been reported so far, because um, you know usually censorship is reported uh, based on the network or the location of the host or the endpoint. But we show that censorship could actually happen somewhere completely different in between. Next slide. Yeah, our uh, measurements also had uh, other implications for censorship measurements in general. So we saw that um, much of the censorship actually happened at the endpoint itself, which indicates local policies and not ISP blocking. And this might warrant a slightly different level of scrutiny. And we also saw that some devices uh, actively try to hide what they're doing, or, or you know, they're harder to detect because they do things like copying um, IP header values. Next slide. Okay, so um, you know, now that we identified the network location of censorship, the next step that we wanted to perform is identify who the, who manufactures these devices. Next slide. From the um, um, uh, information that we collected with the trace routes, um, you know, we we have some knowledge that can help us with the steps. For instance, if the device is deployed in path, then frequently we'll know the actual IP address of the hardware that is um, you know hosting the uh, firewall software. Next slide. And using the um, um, the IP address, we can gather a bunch bunch of information. Like we can perform um, um, you know handshakes on application layer protocols and collect banners on any open ports. And even if there are no open ports, we can still um, perform uh, uh, packet level fingerprinting techniques like Nmap um, and collect lower level fingerprints. Next slide. Okay, so using our um, uh, using uh, these application layer protocols, we collected a bunch of different banners. And then we investigated these banners both manually and also using popular fingerprint database like Rapid7 Recall. Um, we also investigated uh, some of the block pages that these network devices sent. And from these block pages, we were able to see that most of the censorship in these four countries were enforced by the ISPs themselves using locally grown technology. Next slide. Um, but what I actually want to focus on in today's, um, sorry, the, gra the graphic in this slide isn't, isn't clear, but what I actually want to focus on in, in today's talk is the 19 network devices that we found that were manufactured by commercial vendors, including uh, manufacturers like Fortinet and Cisco. And we are seeing that you know, these, these companies usually develop security firewalls that are designed to prevent attacks. But we were also able to see in some context that these devices can be used for a dual use purpose, that for content blocking of legitimate network traffic. So, um, you know, the, the same technology that is used to block network attacks and stuff like malware can also be easily repurposed and reconfigured to block legitimate network access. 
And we saw that you know network administrators were using these devices in these countries to block everything from um, uh, gaming to social media websites. And you know we didn't we didn't go our study doesn't go into the appropriateness of this blocking because that is subjective. But one thing that I really want to emphasize here is that the lack of transparency and auditing can easily lead to the misuse of network firewall software. And I think there's a significant need for developing guidelines and standards, especially here at the IATF, for um, you know, more auditing and more uh, transparency in, in, in the uh, censorship ecosystem, especially when it comes to uh, these commercial providers. Next slide. So uh, this is a good start, but we wanted to go even one step further. We wanted to ask the question of whether you know, censorship devices in, in different deployments across different countries behave the same way or not. Next slide. So, I, you know, we, we went back to the question of uh, how does how is censorship implemented, right? A key insight is that even though censorship at a high level follows the same techniques, there's some amount of uh, deep packet inspection of the traffic and then some way that the censorship system reacts. But actually the lower level implementations tends to vary quite a lot depending on the network stacks of these devices, right? So we wanted to see whether, you know, there are specific idiosyncrasies that we could identify. And next slide. You can go on further. You know, for this purpose, we um, um, developed a censorship fuzzer that we call Senfuzz that sends slightly different traffic um, uh, to see how the censorship device behaves. And this, this gives us more insight into the rules and triggers of the censorship device. We are effectively reverse engineering uh, uh, the network stacks here. So for instance, let's say that a normal HTTP GET request for censored.com is blocked. Next slide. We see that even changing the request in slightly different ways, like capitalizing the uh, host keyword in different ways, manages to evade some devices. And you know, uh, we, we, we created a bunch of strategies like this. Next slide. So we use the you know, HTTP and TLS grammars to identify key parts of the request that could be passed differently by a middle box. A thing I'd like to note here is that our fuzzer generates both uh, valid and invalid, that is like not RFC compliant requests, but that is completely fine because we don't need the correct response from the server. We were just trying to see how the middle box behaves to different requests. Next slide. So th these are just uh, a few of the, you know, the HTTP strategies that we developed. Um, next slide. To run through a few, uh, we, you know, we used a uh, different HTTP methods other than get like post or uh, put. Next slide. We change the path in different ways by adding query parameters and other values. Next slide. And we also removed or capitalized certain parts of the uh, HTTP method and other parts of the request to see how the middle box behaves. Next slide. So this shows a subset of our results. You can find a full uh, set of our results in the paper. But I'd like to point out uh, some interesting things here. So we saw that you know changing the HTTP method or the path evaded a lot of different devices in all four countries. But interestingly, we see that you know, uh, changing the capitalization of the HTTP method evaded some devices specifically in Russia. And the same way, you know, changing capitalization of the HTTP word evaded some devices specifically in Azerbaijan. So there are clearly some of these cases where you know, some of these requests were able to evade certain devices in, in a specific country. And you know, we can use requests like this to then fingerprint these devices. Next slide. You can go on further. And um, you know, this, this shows uh, a subset of our uh, TLS fuzzing results. Again, we can see that changing the cipher suite or uh, the version, even the TLS version, actually successfully evades some devices in Russia. And it, this, this can actually be useful for circumvention too. Next slide. OK, so now we've collected a bunch of different features from, you know, from our trace routes, from our active probing, and from our, our fuzzer. Next slide. Naturally, the next thing that we did is put all of these together and then you know, uh, try to see what are the similarities between different devices in these countries and what are the differences. Next slide. So we took all of the features that we, we've collected so far and then we've clustered these features using the DB scan algorithm. And then we label these clusters using the vendor information or the ISP information when this is available from our banners of log pages. Next slide. So this shows uh, uh, the results of our clustering. So the y-axis here shows you know, the number of devices in different countries. And then the x-axis, each, each bar on the x-axis is a different cluster. Next slide. There are two interesting things here. Um, the first is that you know, maybe, maybe a very, uh, in a very expected manner, devices within the same country or ISP form really, really tight clusters. But uh, another interesting point here is that even within 
um, uh, the same country, there are different clusters within the, among different ISPs. So there are different diff uh, device deployments. Next slide. And we also saw that you know clusters from devices with the same vendor also form really tight clusters. Um, and you know we we can identify cross-country uh, deployments of the same devices through this method. So uh, that is a summary for study, and all of our code and data is completely open source. So. Um, you know, we hope that our tools and our reports uh, uh, democratize the technical in-depth investigation of uh, these censorship devices across the world. So if you want to find more information about our work, I point you to um, our paper in Conex 2022 and also our reports on Sensor Planet and the Open Technology Fund. I, we think that um, work, future work in this, uh, in this direction is sorely needed to highlight policy gaps with respect to the spread of information controls globally. Next slide. Yeah, we, and we also have, uh, you know, very ambitious future directions for this work. I think uh, it has been very useful to already uh, researchers uh, at, at Sensor Planet, at Citizen Lab, and other researchers worldwide. So we are trying to, uh, we are actively integrating these techniques into censorship lighthouses like Sensor Planet and Uni. This will this will help us collect, you know, data in more countries, including, um, you know, other than the four that we've already studied. Um, I would also love to work with the IETF community to. Um, and encourage more transparency in the uh, in the censorship ecosystem. So one thing that can help monitoring a lot is enforcing standardized error messages and blocking mechanisms. And this can both help um, you know the researchers like us who are actively trying to monitor this, but also inform end users of the reasons behind blocking. And I think this is super important. Uh, we can even go one step further and encourage some of these uh, commercial device vendors to publish their block list for auditing, and this can help with uh, you know, uh, avoiding any false positives. And finally, I'd also like to you know, encourage the community to adopt privacy preserving standards like zero knowledge middle boxes that can you know, um, give more privacy to the users and encourage auditable blocking. Next slide. Uh, and we can go on further. Okay, um, so I'd like to leave you with this slide with the key takeaways and happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll start with uh, Mallory since you're there, and then we'll go to the, the Q online. Thank you, because I my my device is a brick right now. Um, thanks for your talk; it was really interesting. Back around like slide 31, 32, I thought to myself, I've seen this before. It's when um, censorship circumvention tools that I'm familiar with that now have a lot of different techniques that they use. Um, are trying to figure out how the thing people are trying to reach is blocked. So they kind of get to this point where they could really leverage what you've done, figure out what's being blocked, and then the tool or the VPN or whatever they're using then more straightforwardly can decide how to get around the block. So I feel like your application, you've taken it in some obvious directions for additional measurement and making that better. Um, I'd also like to think about how um, the work you've done can make the circumvention piece easier. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great comment. So we actually saw that some of the requests that our cursor was generating was actually able to, you know, bypass the sensor and get the correct content from the from the server. So um, I think that's definite value for the circumvention community um, and for tools like Geneva that, that perform um, some of these first requests. Hi, Olivier Gros. Um, in one of your slides, we have seen only IPv4 ad IP addresses. Have you tried to do with IPv6 uh, connectivity? And if in this case, was the measurements the same? That's a great question. Um, so in this uh, study, we only considered IPv4 addresses. We didn't look at IPv6, although that's you know something that's an easy extension because we can use the same hop limit values for conducting our trace routes. Um, and for performing the other measurements. The reason why we used only IPv4 is that a bunch of the data for our remote measurements and IP addresses all came from uh, platforms like Sensor Planet and Uni, which only have IPv4 data available. So that's how we selected our endpoints. Um, so that's why we restricted ourselves to IPv4. But I, I think this is a great future direction. And I expect to see these results uh, uh, generalized linearly towards IPv6 too. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Can't read it. I think am I next in the queue, Chris Patton? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, hey Rom, this is great work. Keep doing it. Thank you. Um, 
if you could wave a magic wand and change anything about the TLS charter or the HTTP tar charter or any working group in the IETF that's working on standards that are relevant to censorship, what would you, what would you say, what would you tell those people to do? That's a really, really, really good question. So um, I think the most realistic thing that I really want to happen is again, encourage more transparency, right? So there's a lot of opaqueness about anything that's happening here. Censorship is obviously a very, you know, like opaque from both the people that deploy it and from the people that provide the technology to deploy it. And, you know, more transparency from either of these cases would, would benefit a lot. And this includes things like, you know, actually um, uh, providing error messages that say, this is the reason for the blocking. This is who is performing the blocking. Right. And even, uh, you know, providing our open sourcing block list can help us understand why a certain website is blocked. Maybe it shouldn't be blocked and we can make more, uh, you know, we can advocate towards the removal of that blocking. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Michael B, UK NCSC. Um, I think you can mostly just answer my question, but is, is there any reason why these firewalls that are dual use should be able to transfer, uh, should be able to block something and sort of hide the fact that they are in, indeed blocking it? That doesn't seem like something a firewall should be should, should be able to do for cyber security reasons anyway. Yeah, I mean, I've, uh, that's a great question. I think we've seen that um, most of a, a lot of this firewall technology, you know, they provide their own domain categorization service. That's not just limited to classifying something as an attack or not. They also classify, you know, what type of website it is, and then they provide the network administrators the feature to be able to go and just click those categories to block, right? So yeah, if, I, if I am using one of these security firewalls right now, I can go and say, I don't want any users behind this device to be able to go to a social networking website or something. And then the real danger comes from when these firewalls are inappropriately used by, uh, you know, large networks like ISPs to block access to residential users who are not aware of this happening. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you very much for the search. It's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, hey, Ron, thanks. Um, I was going to ask, uh, you made the comment as to, uh, you know, investment in things like zero knowledge middle boxes can help here. I wasn't quite sure I understood it, but I think your conversation with Chris sort of clarified it for me. Um, so I just wanted to say uh, thanks for the talk, even though I caught the end of it. Uh, good for you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you again to all, all three speakers, actually. We, we have three absolutely fantastic talks today. Uh, a reminder, um, a reminder that the, the ANRP only exists because of your nominations. So if you know any good work and you want to see the talks next year, please do nominate. Thank you, everybody. Uh, I hope to see you, uh, some of you in Brisbane in, uh, I guess, March it is. And uh, again, I look forward to your nominations. Thanks, everyone.